research shows that less than one third of patients with an advanced serious illness discuss their goals and preferences with their clinicians. Now, patients with severe chronic illness such as cancer, congestive heart failure, or even Alzheimer's, just to name a few, really need to be at the center of discussions with not only their care providers, but with their family as well. Now, to foster this dialogue and process, more than 90 Massachusetts-based organizations have come together to form the Massachusetts Coalition for Serious Illness Care. Our next guest, Reverend White, well, Reverend White Hammond, she's a doctor actually too, uh, is working with the Massachusetts Coalition for Serious Illness Care to actively train faith leaders on how to have those very difficult end-of-life care discussions with members of their own congregations. Welcome to Urban Update, Reverend Gloria E. White Hammond. Well, thank, well, thank you so much, Alberto. I'm glad to be here, especially on Mother's Day. Yes. I, I have a few other places I could be, but I'm High delighted five. to be here with you. Hi, five. And you could be at church. I'm on my way. You're on your way. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you know what? Let's start right there. How did you get involved with uh, this coalition? Well, as you said, I'm both a physician and a pastor. And so in both of those roles, I interface with families and who have serious illnesses. And I realized that in neither of those professions had I had a lot of training around how to support individuals who are facing serious illnesses and especially end-of-life care. So I needed some training and wanted to ensure that my colleagues had training as well. Yeah, what, what have you noticed that people, and I imagine from all walks of life, doesn't matter what point, income, what socioeconomic background, what do they not do? Or they're not really prepared, right? Because it's not something that you usually plan for, correct? That's right. Um, we have gotten to a place where death doesn't seem to be so normal as a part of our conversation. Conversations and so people often enter into end of life care not having talked so much about it with fears and apprehensions and not having communicated with their loved ones what their values and preferences and goals are. Yeah, and what are some of those tough decisions? Well, some of those tough decisions would be, for example, uh, treatment, what kinds of treatments I do or don't want. A critical issue is when I'm not able to speak for myself, who should speak for me? Who should be my health care proxy? So that is the health care proxy that's talked about, right? That's the right. One designated family member. That's right. It may be a family member, it might be a close friend, but it's someone who knows you well and that's the person with whom you share what my wishes would be again when I'm not in a position to speak for myself. Mm. Now how are you currently working to train faith leaders because um, that's your expertise as well right with uh, all that your family does for the city. Um, how's that going? It's going really well. Uh, several years ago I became involved with the Massachusetts Coalition for Serious Illness and one of the co-chairs for the coalition is uh, Dr. Atul Gawande who's a surgeon who developed um, a serious illness conversation guide initially for clinicians trying to help individuals with serious illness and to discern their, um, their, their end of life care wishes. When I looked at that guide I realized that those are some of the conversations that clergy can engage with as well. So what is your understanding about the disease? Uh, what are your fears and apprehensions? What are the places from which you can draw strength? What might be your goals? And so as I looked at those conversations I said you know what? Spiritual leaders can engage in those conversations as well. So when an individual is diagnosed with a serious illness, what are the multiple conversations over the duration of the journey can we have? Yeah, because in our, in our communities, um, are not faith leaders one of the first places that we go to? Absolutely. Um, patients often turn to their spiritual leaders for support when they're diagnosed with a serious illness. And as I say, um, faith communities are, you don't graduate from a faith community, it's a cradle to grave operation. Mm -hmm. So they often are interfacing with the community long before they even develop the serious illness. Yeah, and, and you, you're kind of part of both worlds, right? You're part of the scientific I am. medicine world, and then you're part of this non-scientific, faith-based universe. Absolutely, and I love to operate in that intersection because, in fact, most people don't tease out body, mind, spirit. It's just me. And so we see ourselves as being reflective of all of those different components. So I love operating in that space. So I want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about your particular congregation, where they're located, and 
the folks that are waiting for you to get That's get over there now. Right, I am, um, and along with my husband and pastor at Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Jamaica Plain, we're a wonderful congregation of um, individuals of diverse generations, largely African American, mm -hmm. and um, these are individuals who are excited about life, deeply committed to serving God and serving God's people. So now, your so husband's been here before. My husband has been a lot of places before. My husband is the Reverend Dr. Ray Hammond, who is just an amazing man, really grateful to be uh, um, his wife and the mother of his kids, and he's deeply involved in lots of issues. Do me a little favor, remind him that we have an ongoing tie kind of competition because whenever he comes here he tries to wear a, a brighter tie and usually he wins he's a very he's a very good dresser he's a, he and he picks out his own ties yes he's he yeah that's well. right yeah so please let him know that uh, I'm thinking of him as well today I thought of him when I wore this tie well thank you so much <laughs> I will be sure to let him know that um, before we go some good news right there seems to be a cultural shift and some positive momentum um, going around the country in terms of people who now realizing that this is a critical part of their health care, mm -hmm. right? That's How right. do we keep that going? Well, certainly shows like this are really important, Alberto, so really, you know, high five to you for even talking about this subject. And there are, are a number of places in popular literature, on television, uh, even in television shows where people are featuring end yeah. of life conversations. And I think as more people have better experience, because we know that when those conversations are had in advance, then people do have a, a better quality of care. They're more satisfied with the quality of care. As more of those experiences are shared, then people will feel more encouraged to talk about these issues. Well, I want to thank you for taking time out, A, on Mother's Day, and B, on Sunday. I know that you, you, know, you, you do have some responsibilities today on many levels. So thank you for taking the time to kind of inform us a little about this really important subject matter. Well, thank you, and thanks to your listening audience for all the ways that they are advancing the conversation as well. Great. Thank you so much. Thank okay. You. In just a few moments, Ecuador. Do you know about Ecuador? You've been to Ecuador? I have not been to Ecuador. We're going to take you on a trip to Ecuador, the nation that sits right on the equator, and they celebrate with a yearly gala here in Massachusetts. We'll have all the details right here on Urban Update.